Climate Change and Energy Futures Workshop was held at the Nexus Center at Memorial University on October 10th and 11th, 2018. The workshop was co-organized by Mark C.J. Stoddard at Memorial University, John McLevy at the University of Waterloo, Vanessa Schweitzer at the University of Waterloo, and Catherine Meiling Wong from the University of Luxembourg. The workshop was held to engage in thinking futures related to climate change and energy with attention to the social values that underlie decision-making in a carbon-constrained world. The workshop had participants from Australia, Canada, Finland, Germany, Iceland, India, Luxembourg, and the United States. It also included a range of disciplines such as sociology, geography, political science, and environmental studies, as well as community speakers. The presentations and discussions generated new insights into how energy systems may be reconfigured to address the problem of climate change and promote social ecological well-being. Transdisciplinary and international contributions focus on the social challenges, possibilities, and trade-offs involved in pursuing fossil fuels, nuclear power, hydroelectric, and emerging renewable energy technologies. Welcome to the sixth episode of Cross Currents, a podcast of Memorial University's Nexus Center for Humanities and Social Sciences Research. My name is John Sandloss, and I'm the director of the Nexus Center and the producer of the podcast. In this episode, you'll be listening to two talks from the workshop and some of the participants who've also talked through an interview about the workshop experience. We begin with a talk by Carrie Norgard from the University of Oregon with the title of Whose Energy Future? Whose Imagination? Mark and John and all of you for coming in the first set of uh, panel uh, talks this morning is like lots of, I mean, my mind is going and um, and uh, also just like uh, really noticing um, you know, this is really a lot of complex theory at different levels, and, you know, especially with the interdisciplinarity, like, trying to sort of grapple with the different approaches that people have, and um, so if climate change wasn't enough. <laughs> so, um, so um, and what I want to try to do is, um, is pull together... Uh, I mean, my latest thinking has been pulling together two things I've been working on for a really long time. So some people may know the work I've done that's more that's on denial and um, the difficulties we have thinking about climate change, which was you know so exciting to hear your stuff this morning. Um, and at the same time as I was actually working on that book, I've been involved in this other project, which I'm now getting more... Um, uh, getting publishing and and um, and they come together in some really interesting ways. So I've been working for the last fifteen years with a Kaduk tribe doing, um, which is the second largest tribe in the state of California, doing uh, very applied policy work. So on the one hand, the living in denial stuff is very more theory, and this is like really applied policy work um, related to uh, initially not climate change, but now has been very much related to climate change. But um, so when we started, you know, when I first started hearing what this was about, I am um, uh, very interested in imagination and what we imagine, what we don't imagine. And one of the things that is really clear to me um, as a sociologist, and I've written a little bit about in a couple of places, is just our lack of imagination is it's very dangerous right now. Um, and um, and we don't have very good nuanced imaginations around what's either what's happening or what we can do and need to be doing and 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 so that's why all of our work is really really important and the topic particularly at least I think um, but I want to say a little bit about um, sort of whose futures and whose imaginations and um, I really liked these questions so I put them up <laughs> and I want to try to refer and weave to them through the comments. Um, uh, that I'll make, sort of how are energy futures conceptualized from different social theories that have attempted to address the issue? How has um, climate change uh, changed our conception of energy futures? Um, can we imagine the future? And then um, what does this mean for interdisciplinary research and theory and practice? And I have some things to say about each of these, and hopefully it'll all kind of come together just beautifully clearly for all of you, despite the fact that I'm pulling things together in a new way. Um, so... I think that uh, this issue of whose future and whose imagination is really um, critical. And uh, um, one of the reasons is that um, although I, I, 
um, incredibly appreciate, especially the theory of projection and all of the psychology um, and the work, you know, my own work on denial is really building in that. Um, I think that the, um, the structural piece um, is incredibly important around who, what we are imagining and what we're told, what we're offered as both the story of now and the story of the future, and certainly the um, influence, and of course we see this incredibly in what's happening in the United States right now, the influence of right-wing politics on the ability to shape the story of what's happening is extremely profound. Um, it has knocked me sideways this past week to realize the strength of that discourse uh, ability, in addition to the um, obviously the political power and the overt manipulation of all of these um, kinds of th threats to democracy in those ways, the um, the importance of the ability to manipulate the the meaning of events um, is really and so one of the things actually was going to put a slide in apologizing. Um, one of the things I talk about in, in my first work on denial is the idea of, um, Stan, from Stanley Cohen um, of different forms of denial. There's literal denial, which is when you say it's not happening. We see this with climate change, the literal denial. Um, but then there's interpretive denial, which is when you say it happened. You know, yes, she probably was sexually attacked, as every woman pretty much I've met has been in some way. Or, but it, it wasn't him. It wasn't what you think it is. And sort of the power of that moment, certainly with climate change, we're seeing that as well. Um, that, you know, it's, there's less just sort of overt saying climate change isn't happening um, as much as, you know, these particular events or they don't, they don't mean this or that. So now I've gotten way far afield of this. And then there's the kind of implicatory denial, which is the denial where we're just not able to integrate the systems, which is incredibly important, and it's been a major focus in my work. So, so what we imagine is very bound up in, um, in the um, what, what we're told <laughs> and how we interpret what's happening. And I think whose energy future is incredibly important because while on the one hand I'm particularly interested with the energy futures in this community, this is my close <coughs> friend and research collaborator, um, Ron Reed, um, who's a traditional dipnet fisherman. Here he is on that side um, and um, with the dipnets. Um, but um, uh, so certainly like whose future is being talked about, and we can think about it in maybe really overt cases of environmental uh, justice, this um, this community kind of people are quite impoverished and, and outside of the sphere of the political discourse, at least in some ways. But it's also about whose energy future. There's a lot of discussion about us, um, society, as though we are all of the same energy future, as though what's good for the fossil fuel industry is what's good for you, as though, you know, these kinds of, um, of discourse without talking about who really is benefiting, who's losing, not only in the, extent, in the case of very extreme um, communities where we can say, oh, well, that community is clearly not benefiting, but what is happening to the middle class? Um, and and are, um, you know, are the folks who, who are earning a decent income now um, on working on oil rigs, what's, what's, what's really going to be good for them and their families in this year, in five years, and so forth? Okay. Sorry, it's just going to be like this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so one thing I want to say um, uh, that um, back to um, that first question, sort of how have we conceptualized um, the future and, um, and, 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 and then how does it begin to change? So one thing that's been really eye-opening for me working with indigenous communities for the last 15 years is um, be becoming increasingly aware of myself as a settler and becoming increasingly aware of the um, profound success, legitimacy, uh, intelligence, sophistication of indigenous political, epistemological, and ecological systems. And one way that this applies um, is that my discipline, sociology, um, which I, I have uh, learned a lot from and think within that system, um, is very much born sort of in this modernist frame. Um, and there are Marxist sociological traditions which have a strong, you know, from the get-go, critique of capitalism, which is also speaking to sort of how do we currently conceptualize energy futures. So uh, Marxist conceptions of 
what's happening now and what may happen in the future do have theories of instability based in contradictions of capitalism. Or, or it's not the sense of that ontological misfit, which um, I apologize, I'm forgetting your name right now. Um, when you're Mihai um, um, was describing at the beginning and was referred to um, as well in terms of that, you know, that that misfit. We can't wrap our minds around it because it's so incongruent from um, from the existing systems. Um, but sociology, it was very much born in this, pro, you know, progress, technological progress, uh, these kinds of things. And so, within that framework it's very difficult to conceptualize climate change because climate change is really challenging the tenability of our economic, political, social systems, and so <coughs> forth. Um, and um, so, but if you think about how do these accounts look, if we, if we think about very far outside either even the Marxist critiques or the, the sort of idea that progress is here and it's working and, and we can get away from... Um, you know, we no longer need nature and all of those kinds of assumptions fr from us, from which sociology is grounded, um, it does, things look quite different. And um, in fact, for um, my uh, colleague and, and friend, um, there there is no misfit <laughs> in the way that it is for me um, that, that, that there's a problem. This problem, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but it, um, it it's not such an ontological clash because there has been a sense of struggle and that the, that the existing system of capitalism and colonialism has been lived with and is problematic for a long time. Okay, so um, as I said earlier, we have very limited ability, I think, in our you know, intellectual, uh, academic, broader discourse, just our language, our understanding of, um, of how, of what's happening ecologically is actually gotten quite a bit better. I think we do have a decent grasp there. But our understanding of, um, you know, how, of, of energy mixes, of how we get from, um, you know, this was referenced in, in Dr. Raymond's talk, you know, how we get from, um, uh, you know, impacts to daily life. There's just huge gaps. How, how we understand the problems, um, the extent to which the fossil fuel industry, I think, is really shaping our understanding of the problems. All of that, there's just we just don't even have a conversation about those things. We have very um, vacuous conversations about what can really be done and how to get somewhere else. And I actually think that that is as much of a problem for us as, uh, as these psychological things, which are also a problem, is that we're not really talking, we don't have a discourse about what can be done. Okay, so um, present second, again, in the current... In the current modernist, we have all the um, modernist vein, you know, where the world is better, we no longer need nature. All of this climate change is a major, profound threat to our understanding of security and how the world works. Um, but, but at the same time, our discussion, our ability to talk about what's happening is very much shaped by, um, by discourses that are not, you know, not coming from the kind of... Um, of uh, deliberative democracy <laughs> that was just spoken about. On the other hand, um, what we have, um, and I was just last week at a, um, a dissertation defense of a wonderful uh, doctoral student in our program, or in the English and Environmental Studies program, um, April Anson, about looking at literature and how the on the left the discourses about what is um, uh, about what's going to happen in the future is extremely apocalyptic, and it it kind of re I mean it really can lend into um, uh, right wing, it really plays into right wing power seizing kinds of things. I don't study, I don't study literature, cli-fi, whatever they call it. Um, but the the fourth thing here is that from the indigenous communities that I work with, there is a very long history of um, of struggle, of being told that you're about to be gone, um, and um, figuring out how to continue to adapt and thrive, um, and survive and uh, and thrive um, anyway. So, um, so unlike when I look at the climate discourse, sort of in, you know, the white middle class urban communities that, that I'm connected to, um, the the folks I work with and have been working with for the last 15 years, they have a really clear what sociologists call sociological imagination. They have a really clear sense of what is going on, and they have a lot of ideas about what to do about it, and they are doing them. Um, instead of sort of you know, I mean, I, my, my, my husband of 20 years, my 
the love of my life is very into bicycle advocacy, so I don't mean to be uh, dissing anyone that's excited about bicycles. But the problem with this is that it, it's very different kind of, it's a very nice, warm and fuzzy, it's not going to upset anybody um, compared to really talking about, for example, what are the ecological and environmental justice impacts of the way this community is earning um, its income. Um, Okay, so um, in the sociological imagination is a lot about seeing relationships. Uh, the early work I did with the Kirk tribe is, this is my friend Ron uh, Dipping, and um, instead of eating fish, salmon, which as folks in this part of the world certainly know, um, incredibly healthy. This was, um, there's a whole much could be said. Um, people are eating commodity foods. There's some of the highest rates of hunger in the state of California. Um, and people are not, uh, they get it. They understand, they can see those relationships. Um, seeing connections between events, seeing patterns over time, and seeing the role of the state in this. There's a lot of discussion as well. Um, here we're looking at fire suppression, which is the issue I've been working on more recently related to climate change. Um, we have had 100 years of fire suppression, and now, and coupled with climate change, there's um, huge, large fires um, happening every year. Um, and the role of the state in that is, um, is quite explicitly understood. And there's a lot of sense of uh, responsibility to act, um, a sense of human communities, a sense of um, this is, uh, again, um, asking about the role of other species, a sense of humans being involved, uh, connected with and having responsibilities to other species who also have responsibilities to humans. Um, and so these are a few, um, this is a slide I actually grabbed from a talk I gave um, uh, back in Sydney last December, so that's why it mentions the Adani coal mine on it. Um, but this sense that you know we do need one of the things that we need. If we're going to talk about um, energy futures and and imagine and imagining the future. We do need to be able to talk about besides riding bicycles, besides taking public transportation. What are the many, many, many different things that you can do? Five, Five minutes. Okay, I'm going to have a bunch of photos coming soon, so it'll go faster. Okay, so. Um, uh, the idea of, um, in fact, I'm probably going to have to just sort of cut some stuff. So one of the things, uh, thinking about social theory and social theorizing, what kind of social theorizing can we do if we are to account for indigenous perspectives in sociology that could look, help us to imagine futures differently and imagine energy futures uh, differently as well? Um, and so I'm going to... Um, this is one of my other uh, collaborators, Lee Hillman, the uh, founding director of the um, Kirk Depar Department of Natural Resources. Um, and I think I'll um, show a couple slides here, and then I'm actually going to drop the other things that I'm going to suggest and just go talk a little, close with a few slides of thinking about um, the violence, essentially. Um, so um, I mentioned that part of why I think that we don't have this epistemic juncture, and there's actually a paper a graduate student and I um, have, I forget where it's um, coming out, it might be a book chapter, um, this particular thing, um, where we're comparing different um, sort of right-wing views, uh, folks in Norway, uh, preppers in the United States, and sort of homesteaders, and then folks in the Kruk tribe, and looking at how do their worldviews, uh, and how does climate change fit in with these different worldviews. Um, the, but the idea that both for the issues that I've been working on with the tribe, um, whether it's dam removal or um, fire suppression, um, that these problems are not understood, or climate change related fire suppression, these problems are not understood as sort of new things, but they're really understood in this long arc of colonialism and, um, and, and the ways that that's interfered with people's relationships and the things to do with it need to do. And I want to draw here, especially on um, Kyle White's work. If you haven't um, read his work, he's a Potawatomi philosopher. Um, and I'll just read this one quote from him, and then I'm going to um, move uh, to just some images in terms of whose energy futures and, and close there. Um, but um, White, Kyle White is saying, Through the climate, though this climate destabilization is described in the Anthropocene futures may be a distinct ecological challenge for indigenous peoples, we experience nonetheless as associated with an iteration of patterns of industrial settler strategies and tactics that is very familiar to us from our experiences with and memories of other kinds of anthropogenic environmental change. And I encourage you to read his work more. It's been very formative for me in thinking about how is it that on this continent, and I don't know the specifics in this place, but there have been indigenous people um, thinking through many similar kinds of problems, which is not to say that climate change is not of a new order to a certain degree, um, and resisting 
um, struggles and, and threats to life and survival in ways. And for me, um, from, for a long time, and for me, instead of thinking about climate change as a wholly new problem, it then becomes how do you how do you listen and learn from communities, whether it has to do with their political systems of governance, which do include other beings um, in them, um, or, 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 or watch what allows them to mobilize to social action, or these kinds of things as a, a rich way of, um, a, a, of, of feeling less like, oh my god, there's nothing I can do, or um, wow, this problem is so new, I'm just paralyzed by it. Okay, now you're gonna see how incredibly overambitious I was. Um, with all the slides that are in here, but I think it will work fine to go to um, just a few, how does this, is that the thing I want? The next one, thank you. Okay, so I want to um, think about, so in terms of whose energy future we're talking about, I want to just hold out that in there are, I see two very different visions of futures with between indigenous and what fossil fuel industries are sort of in the right wing Trump government and so forth is putting together. And I want to think about um, uh, the place of violence, the place of physical violence, the place of ecological violence, and the place of sexual violence, which is relevant in all these cases and certainly has been very foremost on my mind this past week in legitimating and in keeping in place these different kinds of systems. So these are um, images. Um, from Standing Rock, um, I know that there's uh, many I could have taken probably from here locally, um, versus the images of prayer, of community, of, um, of, of, of joy, of relationships, of learning, um, of, of visions that honor women's bodies and our strengths and our ability to care for one another. Um, so just thinking about these images of whose energy futures. This is um, large fires and fire suppression. Um, this is uh, behind Iron Gate Dam, the um, highly toxic algae that's growing there. Um, this is again very dangerous fires. One of my graduate students lost her father in a fire just this spring. Um, I know many people that have lost their homes from these really high level fires versus the kinds of, um, this is the Klamath River fish kill. Um, versus the um, cultural burning that's happening, and these are school children with fire right behind it. One of my other graduate students um, just came back from uh, doing a week-long workshop on from the Kruk tribe how to do cultural burning. So I'll just leave it there. So thank you. I hope it wasn't too incoherent. Now we hear from Howard Ramos from Dalhousie University. Well, you know, it's it's great to get a chance to uh, meet with a bunch of folks who are working at uh, issues of climate futures and energy futures and looking at it from a lot of different angles. Uh, you know, it's very unusual to be able to, on the one hand, get people who are doing advanced statistical analysis, doing network analysis, or doing scoping studies, and then on the other end, have people doing uh, theoretical work and, and talking about uh, assemblages and, uh, you know, all kinds of things that are, uh, you know, really cutting-edge theory. Uh, and getting those two groups to speak together is not a, a very common thing. So it, it's exciting to be able to be in a space where you have this range of conversation. Um, it's also interesting to kind of hear some of the, the consensuses uh, that emerge in the conversations despite these different perspectives. So, you you know, there's uh, concern about uh, contemporary politics. There's concern about whether we're going to meet our uh, climate targets. There's concern that, uh, you know, despite knowing the inevitable, people aren't taking action. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and on this front, I think that, it, it, you know, that means that there's lots to work with. That if there's that kind of consensus, it's now time to take a step back and have a bit of a humility and ask ourselves, well, why is that the case? And why is the message not necessarily getting through? And, and, and I think that that's something that can come out of uh, these kinds of discussions, too, of, of kind of getting to be able to ask ourselves, uh, you know, are we too comfortable in knowing what we know? Yes. And, and, and so on this front, it's great to also have people who come in from community um, 
and talk about how important it is to be able to offer tangible actions on the ground kind of practices and to be able to do that kind of uh, translation as mm -hmm. well. Uh, other, otherwise, what we do is we become better at our theories, we become better at our modeling, uh, but we still, five to ten years from now, will be having the same conversations. Yes. Uh, you know, so I, I feel very hopeful that you know one of the great things that can come out of this is uh, it facilitates uh, a new energy for folks. We we have an energy to go uh, for a few more months or a year uh, to explore things. We get to try out different things, new new books, concepts. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have kind of messages or seeds that are planted that allow us to kind of look and ask ourselves, uh, you know, what, what are we missing? Mm -hmm. The next interview is with Locus Brooksbank from the Cairns Institute at James Cook University. So the, the whole workshop experience, I think, um, coming from a, a southern hemisphere kind of perspective, it was really good to learn about what uh, people in kind of Europe as well as uh, Canada mm -hmm. are are talking about and what their research is really looking at in regards to, to climate change and considering the work that uh, myself and a few of my colleagues are doing in Northern Australia and in Papua New Guinea, I think it gives a good uh, it gives a good outlook of what the future may look like for us uh, because we're not quite at that stage yet where we're talking uh, really clearly about uh, climate change and, and global warming still worrying <coughs> Um, about things that are uh, a little bit more applied, if you like, in the research. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was really, it was really good to learn about what if you know if we do keep developing and keep going forward, what could be, what could be there for the future. Yes, thank you. We'll hear now from a short interview with Angela Carter from the University of Waterloo. This workshop, I went to the first one in Waterloo two years ago, and uh, I had the same feeling this week that I did then. It uh, was very collegial, very dynamic, multidisciplinary, this time even richer though because we had so many people from around the world really. The, the scope, the geographic scale was uh, very impressive. So. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of differences that we're working through, the scales on which people are working, some very local, specific, data-driven, some very global and or theory-driven, um, but I feel like bringing that together around the theme was very productive. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Pradeep Swarnakar from India and from the Indian Institute of Information Technology and Management, Gwalior. So I'm very glad to be here in this workshop and Thanks all the organizers for the uh, for inviting me for the workshop. So what I feel about the workshop is that uh, it covers a range of uh, case studies from different uh, disciplinary boundaries or different locations uh, from Iceland to Canada uh, to to Australia. So uh, I find it fascinating. I, I presented one paper of Canadian climate change. Uh, and um, I see that this, this kind of workshop is really helpful to have the continuation of our academic discourse in the energy transition. But I also feel like uh, it's uh, what I mentioned in, in the discussion in the workshop. It's like in future, if we can include more like the important stakeholders in global energy transition, like like uh, some people from developing countries, from India, China, or people working on India and China in Canada, and also people working on the other uh, Scandinavian countries, like like Norway or, or Sweden. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because if we have to think in a macro level, then we have to think globally. So it's, it's very good. To, we have very nice... Uh, case studies from Canadian case and German case and Icelandic case and also there are some comparative study of China, Singapore, India, uh, not India but uh, Australia but uh, it would have been really nice if we get some more cases from the other countries. So this is one and the next one is that uh, this uh, workshop, the uh, energy transition workshop is the, uh, this is like for the future workshop I think it can be uh, added or like organizers can think of it is like uh, like we have more sociologists uh, what I can see and 
particularly the environmental sociologists and also uh, some geographers and political scientists, I believe. But if we can include uh, some of uh, the uh, natural scientists who are interested in the policy dimension, so it's not hardcore natural scientists who are only doing the lab-based work, but sometimes they are more, uh, more, more like to give a thought about their work and how it impacts the policy. So those kind of people, uh, if they are sometimes invited in this kind of workshop, that uh, might help to interact with the social science and natural science dialogue. And in, in the policy, ultimately, if we have to say something about, about the future energy transition policy, in, maybe in Canada, we have to be very specific about, uh, about the pathways uh, of, uh, of, of the government and that natural science input and the social science input might help to get into some areas. Next, we have up a short conversation with David B. Tyndall from the University of British Columbia. Well, I, you know, I thought the the workshop was fantastic in in general. Um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I often go to uh, to conferences where m most everybody is in the same discipline, and I'm in sessions where people are doing, you know, very very similar things. Um, what I thought was was very cool about this workshop is that. Um, you know that there was variation to some extent in terms of disciplines, um, and that meant that instead of you know the research overlapping you know almost exactly, there was a lot of uh, complementary types of things. It was you know different different types of of work, uh, but it was still like really relevant. So so for for me, for example, the people you know who are talking about things like uh, scenarios and, and projecting into the future. And, and, and that sort of thing, um, I think that was uh, that was really valuable, and, and I can kind of think about you know how that might relate to my own work, even though that's not exactly what I'm doing. Um, I think another thing that was very valuable was the um, uh, the international part of it, because again, you know, often we go to I go to conferences where people are kind of mostly from the same area and stuff like that. And so it's it's useful uh, when you you talk with people who are from uh, from different countries. Um, I mean, I think you know social science and sociology to a certain extent. Uh, at least the the kinds of things that I do is dominated by Americans, so we're kind of mostly used to hearing Americans talking about this sort of thing. And so it's useful to hear the types of theoretical frameworks that people from other places are working with, and you know some of the problems, and sometimes the the problems are kind of similar. So, so, so there's a speaker, for example, from Papua New Guinea who is talking about you know issues around mining and and, and protests and stuff like that, which is similar to some of the stuff that uh, that I do and I, I see in British Columbia. But the context of the government and and so on is is quite different. Um, so I thought that was uh, I thought that was quite valuable as well. And I think also, you know, the workshop format is is also really good where you, you hang around with people for you know for several days so you can talk to people at, at lunch or dinner or during coffee break and stuff like that and uh, kind of you know make a more a, a deeper connection with people but also kind of find out more about what they're doing um, at a traditional conference you know often you you come in you give your presentation you know you ask a couple of questions and then you, you leave and you don't see people uh, again so I think that's you know that, that that also is something that was quite valuable. And now another short conversation with Ricarda Scheel from the University of Stuttgart. For me, it was really helpful because I'm still at the early stage of my research career, and um, I feel like when you go to these big conferences, they um, they're good for your CV, but at the same time, it's very much limited to you do your presentation, and then sometimes there are two or three very short follow-up questions, but you never really get the time and also the feedback of more senior people that really go towards the substance of your research. Um, so this is that has been really helpful for me. Um, and the second thing I think is, um, um, so I've been looking at energy futures from a very specific angle, so from, from a scenario planning angle, um, and it was very interesting for me to look at um, other ways of, of conceptualizing futures in terms of the social technical imaginaries, in terms of um, futures that different communities 
create for themselves and actually make happen in, in the present already, so that this kind of saying that the, the future is in the present already um, got a new meaning for me. So I think um, having this diversity of, of perspectives on futures, um, but at the same time, um, it was all going towards a similar path towards how can we envision change and how can we conceptualize um, energy trans transformations. Um, I think that was really, really great for me. Yes. Thank you very much. And for our last short interview, we'll hear from John McClevy from the University of Waterloo. Okay. Uh, well, I think the workshop um, was a great success. Um, it's uh, somewhat unusual to have uh, really productive and constructive conversations across disciplinary lines. Um, but, you know, I think that was one thing that we did exceptionally well this weekend. We had people whose backgrounds are uh, not just in the social sciences, um, but also in other fields, uh, like in environmental sciences sort of broadly, climate policy, risk analysis. Um, and the conversations across those disciplinary lines were extremely productive and, and constructive. Um, but then also, sort of in addition to um, having productive conversations across disciplinary lines, we had um, excellent uh, comparative discussions of different national cases. Um, and then sort of within and across the national cases and the disciplines, we also had an enormous amount of methodological and theoretical diversity, uh, which resulted in, in uh, very uh, exciting and provocative conversations as well. Yeah. Thank you. And for the last part of this episode, you'll hear a talk by Carl Benedictson from the University of Iceland with the title of Society, Technology, Nature, Different Types of Imaginaries in the Energy Transition. Uh, yeah, I'm a geographer, like I said. Uh, I come into this really through a network that I have been participating in for the past few years. European network, one of these sort of uh, umbrella things that uh, the European Union puts up. Most European countries are actually have been cooperating um, on something called renewable energy and landscape quality. And uh, we're just winding this down right now. And if you're interested, uh, there's a book out uh, just published out of the out of the project. Uh, the project has been very much about uh, the ways in which different energy technologies fit into uh, different contexts around Europe, how technologies are deployed and so on, and what explains actually uh, the sort of mismatch between countries in, in the way this proceeds, you could say, perhaps. And uh, this is what I've been looking at a little bit for Iceland. Uh, and uh, my, I will take an, as an example the development of geothermal energy in Iceland, quite a specific aspect of renewable energy, of course. And this, uh, somewhere along the way, I got thinking uh, or, or stumbled across this uh, notion of socio-technical imaginaries. Uh, it was developed by Sheila Jasanov, the STS scholar, and uh, Sang Hyun Kim, a uh, South Korean scholar, a few years ago. And uh, I, I thought that would be a useful way of, uh, as an entrance into discussing how geothermal energy and other energies for that matter have, energy technologies for that matter, have been received differently in different contexts. So, uh, Jason of Kim, they originally proposed this in two, uh, 2009. Uh, in 2015, they produced or, or published this uh, collection of papers, nicely titled Dreamscapes of Modernity, which is kind of fitting, I think. <coughs> and they define social technical imaginaries there as collectively held, insti institutionally stabilized, and publicly performed visions of desirable futures animated by shared understandings of forms of social life and social order, attainable through and supportive of advances in science and technology. I think this is quite, quite neat in a way. So uh, they are very much focused, or actually at the beginning where they were starting this, they were very much focused on the level of the state, of the nation state, you could say. And so it was about public actors, how they... Uh, developed socio certain socio-technical imaginaries 
that uh, were important in how things proceeded then. Well, I started, I would like to propose that we need some other kinds of imaginaries into this, uh, into this mix, if you like. <clears throat> uh, Social technical imaginaries, of course, are about how we see or imagine society and technology, science, fitting together into a future, projected into a future. What is uh, desirable? What is, uh, what is attainable? I think there are other imaginaries also that we might need to consider. There are so uh, we also um, every day uh, have certain uh, assumptions about how we should relate to non-human nature, and that's where landscape comes into uh, comes into this. In my my case, uh, every society, I think, every culture has certain assumptions of uh, what is uh, right, what is proper in terms of relating to non-human nature. Uh, not only landscape, but, but that's part of it. And of course we need to consider other actors than, than the state. And actually, uh, Jason F. and Kim have, have developed that actually in this book, Dreamscapes of Modernity, quite a lot. So this is just a, an idea I'm, I'm working with, very much a work in progress, you could say. Uh, what, what about thinking, how about thinking about social, nat social natural imaginaries as something... Uh, in this way, particular, often unarticulated premises held by certain groups, not only by the state, but also other, other groups, about how human-non-human relations should be structured and, uh, and how this underwrites really discourses and actions by state market actors and civil society groups. So what we have here is a, is a kind of a mix of belief systems, if you like, <coughs> master narratives that are uh, always present in, in every society, I guess. For instance, how, how modernity itself is envisaged or, or thought about. Policy agendas, op obviously, are, uh, are an are an arena where this is all sort of worked out in concrete details, perhaps. We see evidence of uh, imaginaries of the, this kind also in discursive media framing of of, of issues, how nature is, is imagined and, and uh, represented in media, for instance, concepts and phrases being used, and so on and so forth. So this is what I'm uh, trying to uh, work with. Uh, then, uh, you should not read too much, I guess, it's dangerous, but I, I came across this, <laughs> also, also came across uh, a very interesting notion of the carbonscape. There's a recently published paper uh, by two Norwegian geographers, actually, uh, Hovard Hastad and Terje, Terje Vanvik, <coughs> actually talking about Canada and uh, oil sands or, or tar sands developments in Canada. And they <coughs> conceptualize carbonscapes <coughs> as the spaces created by material expressions of carbon-based energy systems and the institutional and cultural practices attached to them. And uh, the way, uh, why I got interested in this is that this, they are trying to deploy uh, assemblage theory, if you like, as a, as a help in, 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 in this. Uh, assemblage theory, some of you may be familiar with that, this has become quite uh, popular in some circles at least. I'm taking my cue from Manuel de Landa. Uh, he is, in turn, basing this on Deleuze and Qatari. I have, must admit I've never been able to read more than one page of Deleuze and Qatari. <laughs> and then I get cross-eyed. And, 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 but uh, Delanda uh, has managed to do this quite, quite nicely, actually. Uh, it's, a, it's a materialist and realist ontology, you could say. It's not only about social construction. This is realist uh, ontology, you could argue. Uh, seeing assemblages as kind of constellations of heterogeneous components, <coughs> familiar in some way for, for, through actor network theory, but uh, presented in a slightly different manner there, and in, in some ways more attentive to issues that uh, actor network theory has actually been criticized quite uh, for, like uh, the, the issue of power, for instance. What matters here is that any assemblage be it the carbonscape or other assemblages, are put together by relations of exteriority 
and interiority. And there are also at work some assemblage converters. There are always at work in any assemblage, there are always some points where things can take a different turn. It's, it's non-deterministic. This is very important, I think. It, it opens up for possibilities of change. Uh, so what we are concerned with is how to disassemble the carbon scape, if you like, and uh, Horstad and, and Vanwick actually discussed this quite nicely. There are maybe actually more signs of this destabilization of the, of the carbon economy than we would oft, often uh, like to think. Okay, one of this uh, is, of course, the energy transition we are always talking about, uh, renewable energy in various forms, how it comes into, into play there. Wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, biomass, you name it. Um, all of this is being deployed to various extents. Which brings me then to Iceland, <coughs> where you have quite a particular uh, mix of, of energy sources. And uh, sometimes Iceland is almost presented as energy heaven. I mean, problems have, problems have been solved, uh, if, you, if you believe some of the presentations in the media and, and by the government and so on. This is actually from a booklet that was put out a few years ago, uh, grandiosely proclaiming that Iceland has succeeded in doing what many consider impossible, transforming its energy system from fossil fuels to clean energy. I wish it was true. <laughs> um, so this is the kind of discourse that uh, is promoted in, in this and, and partially this is true actually I must say mm -hmm. if we look at uh, how energy use has developed in Iceland through uh, f from uh, 1940 until the present you can actually see that uh, oil has been more or less phased out it's only 10, 15% well, perhaps of Primary, all primary energy that is, that is used in Iceland it comes from fossil fuels. And this is unique in the world, uh, almost. Uh, what uh, is most uh, uh, prominent there is geothermal energy, actually. Hydropower is, is the, the rest, more or less. Uh, and this is quite interesting. You can see, actually, how uh, this, has, this has occurred in, in phases, but uh, there are certain historical <coughs> reasons for this, of course. <coughs> but it's an interesting, interesting uh, development. Being a geographer, I thought I should have at least one map. <laughs> uh, what matters to you is probably the, the red things. That's the geothermal uh, installations of various kinds. Don't uh, worry that much about the blue things. They include o actually also some very large hydropower stations, which... Mm. And some of the issues that Cole was talking about are actually quite uh, relevant to this case also. But uh, anyway, what is shown on this map is the, a lot of sort of uh, odd-looking red things, which are district heating systems that are, are uh, all found uh, over most parts of the country. But also the red things there are uh, the geothermal electricity stations power stations using geothermal to produce electricity, mostly in the southwest, but also in the north. And there's actually a new one further up north, which is operating now. Okay, what this shows is basically lots of geothermal energy all over the place. <coughs> there are two forms of geothermal use. There is this direct use, which is mostly using low temperature fields, uh, this has quite a long history. It's a simple technology, easily done, and that's why it's found all over the place. I mean, nice little swimming pools you find in odd places around, uh, but uh, most important, of course, is district heating. This is really the energy transition in Iceland, you could say. The transformation of district heating into using low temperature geothermal energy, starting in Reykjavik in the 1930s, and I think it's something like 95% of all uh, houses in Iceland are now uh, heated by this. Okay, fine. Also, apart from swimming pools and greenhouses and so on, uh, new interesting uses of geothermal energy like melting snow, as if global warming wasn't doing that for us. 
from, from actually from city streets in winter, which is actually quite neat. Uh, but there is also there is another part of geothermal use, which is electricity production. This is making use of high enthalpy fields or high temperature fields. Quite a recent development. It's technologically complex and <coughs> large scale, and this is where I argue that a certain sort of socio-technical imaginary is really has really uh, formed. Um, there, uh, there are these stations that you see, like this one, which is close to Reykjavik. It's, it's the lot, one of the largest of its kind in, in the world, I think. Some 300 plus megawatts of installed power. <coughs> Developed a few years ago, well, taken into use 10, 15 years ago. And uh, has not been totally free of problems, but I will get to that later. Associated with this station is actually a series of very interesting experimental projects that are part of this socio-technical imaginary that is now in operation, you could say. Uh, there are several very interesting projects going ahead. One of them is called CARP Fix. Some of my colleagues in, in, in at the university uh, um, geochemists have been developing a way to actually sequester carbon by taking geothermal water, dissolving CO2 in, in it, pumping it down into the earth, and making it mineralize by itself down there. So it's stored for good once you have done this. Wonderful idea. And this is being promoted uh, quite heavily now, not only for sequestering the carbon that actually comes out of the geothermal station itself. Geothermal stations are not, power stations are not totally carbon free. They, they do emit some, some carbon dioxide. Uh, but also for, uh, also for uh, even on a larger scale, it has been suggested as a kind of a technical fix to the, our, our, our quantity, you could say. If you, if you could just use this in a big way to sequester carbon. Mind you, it, it works only if you have rock that is basaltic. So you need specific conditions for this. Iceland is good for it, as is much of the world's ocean bottoms, but I guess it's a little bit inaccessible. Kind of thing. Uh, related to this is also fixing, uh, actually using the same technology more or less, something called sulfix, fixing uh, hydrogen sulfide in rock. <coughs> this is also a byproduct of geothermal energy manifested in the rotten egg smell you find in, in geothermal places, usually. And last but not least, there is something called the Iceland Deep Drilling Project, sort of a dream of almost uh, endless energy if you just make, if you just go deep enough in the ground. So there's a se the point I'm making is that there is a series of highly technical projects that have come together to form uh, something of a socio-technical imaginary, you could, you could argue, actually. And uh, especially this carp fix uh, project has really caught the attention of the world. These are some of the headlines that came out uh, in, in 2016 when uh, the scientists actually published what was happening down there. Carbon had actually been turned into rock quite... quite uh, Effectively, and uh, the Guardian, for instance, says nothing less than climate change breakthrough, which is perhaps a little bit of an overstatement, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> turning CO2 into stone. Uh, the deep drilling process is equally equally interesting because uh, there are now two extra deep boreholes in place, or one of them actually drilled down to magma. This is considered to be so, by some to be kind of a milestone in, in the development of the Anthropocene, if you like, to, 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 to have uh, actually drilled all the way down to magma. And uh, when the people did this, they, they sort of covered it up very quickly to, to sort of keep, keep things from developing further, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> So, there is a lot of talk then about uh, 
technology, the possibilities of technology, presented in uh, very much kind of a technological fix mode, you could say. The Iceland is obviously doing quite well and is quite happy with its own performance. It's even being promoted around the world as as um, as uh, uh, contributing substantially to so solving solving some of the world's problems. Knowledge is power. Francis Bacon who said happy with this I guess. So this is what the socio technical imaginary look like looks like then in, in my uh, reading. This also translates into, into policy in, in various ways, and not least through the aggressive marketing of the country for energy demanding industries. And if we think back to the uh, historical timeline I, I showed earlier on, it is actually a fact that not many people realize that 80% of all the electricity produced in Iceland is actually sold to energy hungry heavy industries, most notably aluminium smelters. Uh, the growth industry these days is of a different kind. It's these data farms. And almost all of it, believe it or not, is about cryptocurrency. It's about Bitcoin, which I believe is taking worldwide something like the whole energy of, of Switzerland would be sort of, is now devoted to Bitcoin. It's just staggering amounts of new, this new uh, field of energy use, which is so becoming so big. So you, instead of perhaps talking about dreamscapes of moderni uh, modernity <laughs> in this, cape, this case, we could talk about steamscapes. But uh, my argument is actually that, okay, there is also another imaginary at work in Iceland, and this is a socio-natural imaginary that very much such, uh, centers on landscape. Landscape is also very much evident in the way uh, Icelanders talk about themselves, and uh, there are some uh, uh, aspects of this which perhaps could give rise <coughs> to some friction and have been uh, causing some frictions in, friction in the past. Uh, landscape is very much part of a nas uh, the national identity building in the country. It is based on a particular... Uh, view of, of uh, nature, you could say, of course, uh, very much relying on kind of uh, hu humans here and, and nature there and, and uh, aesthetics of the sublime and things, uh, things like that, ideas of wilderness and the untrammeled landscape that I think are quite familiar to North American, North Americans. Um, so uh, and, uh, there is a potential, I think, for conflict there, at least. So it's interesting to see how this goes together. Uh, and I'm just winding down very soon. Um, this uh, surfaces, for instance, in, in uh, a white paper on nature conservation that was published a few years ago. Uh, and they point to the fact that uh, geothermal installations, like you see here, are actually have been, in some cases, carelessly placed in the landscape. So they're distracting from values that that were there in the first place. So uh, it would be interesting to see what, how this develops in the future. Uh, this is as far as I have, have taken this, really. Uh, I would like to think that these concepts are useful for what we're trying to do here, to think about imaginaries and, and uh, both, both socio-technical ones, but also how we think about nature, how nature enters into our, our imaginaries is, is quite an important thing, I think. Um, and I think we can, uh, could uh, make some use of this concept of assemblage to help us understand how particular constellations of uh, energy sources and uses come together and, uh, and, and uh, dissolve uh, even in, in, if that happens. Energy assemblages are uh, never stable, I would, I would think, or I would say. They can unravel if they class with other powerful imaginaries that are around. <coughs> and with that, I <coughs> end the presentation.
Okay, we... To find out about future episodes of Cross Currents, you can follow us on Twitter, at Nexus Center, search up the Nexus Center Facebook page, or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube. The music used in the podcast was licensed under a Creative Commons license, and you can find out more about the music through links on our show notes. The Nexus Center is generously supported by the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Vice President's Research Office at Memorial University. The Climate Change and Energy Futures Workshop was generously supported through the Social Science and Humanities Research Council and by Memorial University. Join us for Episode 7 of Cross Currents when we continue with our series of podcasts from research.